This is video class number 46 of Understanding Revelation. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I want to read to you real quickly uh, what Jeremiah the prophet said in Lamentations chapter 3, verses 21 through 23. He said, This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I just want to encourage you today that the God's mercies are new every morning. God is faithful. And because of that, as the prophet Jeremiah said, we can recall it to our mind and have hope. Our hope can be strengthened. Our faith can be strengthened in the Lord. I pray that you are blessed and strengthened today in your faith. We have so much uh, that God has invested into us through uh, what Jesus has done at the cross. So God bless you today. We're going to get into Revelation chapter 21 some more today as we did last video class. And there's so much in Revelation chapter 21, powerful chapter, talking about the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. But we're going to dig into that today. But before we do, again, if you haven't done so already, again, subscribe to the Corner Ministries YouTube channel, comment, like, that means thumbs up, that really does help our uh, the algorithms with, the, with, with YouTube. Uh, again, just thumbs up, that really does help. And uh, let's have a word of prayer as we do at the beginning of every video class and just ask for the help of the Holy Spirit and ask for His blessing upon your life. Amen? So let's pray. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. We're so thankful that, Lord, your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. We thank you for your love. We ask you for the help of your Holy Spirit. And uh, we just believe it, Lord, today that you would draw us closer to yourself. We thank you for the great things you have in store for us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you want to type in an amen there, go ahead and do so. All right. Well, as I mentioned already, we're going to go back into Revelation chapter 21. And I'm going to put it on the screen here. And we're going to pick up with verse 5. Uh, today, Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 8, describe the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. Now, as we begin this video class, let me just mention this, uh, and I think I might have alluded to it last video class, but let me mention again and make it more clear that there are some who believe, and when I say some, I'm talking about respectable and what I view as uh, respectable and, and legit Bible scholars, uh, especially in the realm of Bible prophecy, that view chapter 21 and even chapter 22 as describing not just the eternal state, describing the eternal state, but describing more than that, but describing also what it's going to be like during the thousand-year reign of Christ. Let me say it again. There are some who believe that chapters 21 and 22 refer to not just the eternal state, but also the thousand-year reign of Christ. Let me, let me say this. There are others who believe that this has nothing to do with the millennium, but it has only to do with the eternal state after the millennium. Some might ask, where do I lean? I personally can, uh, um, I can go both ways with this. I think this is one of those things that is a, it's a, it's important, but it's one of those minor issues and has nothing to do with our sanctification. Okay, it has to do with our future, which is beyond our comprehension to fully, again, fully grasp it. But I, I lean towards this being that it's possible. I just say it this way: it's possible that this is describing. Not just the eternal state, but the way the earth will be during the millennium. I, I just say that as a possibility. And uh, but so we're, we'll talk about that maybe this class, definitely next class. But let's begin with verse 5. It says, And he that sat upon the throne, again, John is seeing this, and the new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Now, that's God who's saying that. 
Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, so God, God's speaking to John here, write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. If you remember from Revelation chapter 1, it was Jesus who said of himself that I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And here is God saying that. And some believe it's G. I believe it's God who's saying that, showing us this: that Jesus is God. All right, this is one of those texts that that when you line it up with again Revelation chapter one, also some things in Revelation chapter five where the Lamb is worshipped, that just proves to us one some among many scriptures that proved to us that Jesus is God. So this God speaking, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. He that overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and warmongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire which burns with fire and brimstone which is the second death now here in verse 6 when god said it is done that's a very important powerful statement there anything that god says of course is powerful but this is one of those statements it's like whoa god said it is done let me let me make uh make this clear that when god says here it is done it's not the same uh, Greek word for done as it is, for example, in John chapter 19 and verse 30, where Jesus was on the cross and he said, it is finished. You might remember that. That is one Greek word, tetelestai. This is not that. This is a different, different terminology in the Greek. And what it's referring to it's ref God is speaking of his progressive purpose and his intended goal for mankind is completed. That's the idea of what God is saying here. It is done. Get this. Uh, and it's a powerful thought that we have this to look forward to as a child of God. That in the garden, when sin came in with Adam and Eve, sin corrupted everything. I mean, it, it completely corrupted everything, and sin was not God's will. Evil was not God's will. Death was not God's will. But sin came in, and it gave Satan the legal right and sin the legal right over mankind. And it, sin affected the entire universe. It affected our planet. affected everything. Uh, and But what Jesus accomplished at the cross is he provided the means for sin and what sin caused to be reversed. Whenever God restores, and that's what Jesus accomplished the cross, he provided the means for everything to be restored. When God restores something, he always restores it better than it was before it was broken. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, I'm going to preach right here. Again, whenever God restores something, he restores it better than what it was before it was broken. And maybe some of you right now need to be restored or you're, you're, you are in that restoring process or maybe you've been restored. I want to encourage you. It's better. What God has is better than what you had before it was broken. And I know people go through very difficult seasons of life and, and things happen that are absolutely, that are absolutely devastating. Okay, and loved ones can die, friends can die. Okay, and that's happened so much in the last couple of years. There have been so many people who have passed away, whether it's from COVID or other issues, heart conditions, I mean, cancer, uh, I mean, the whole nine yards. So many people have passed away. And yes, God can restore and He will restore. That doesn't mean that God's going to raise people up from the dead, doesn't mean that. And things will always be. Things will be tough. We miss people, all right? But even as devastating as that is, what God can do is he can give joy that can be greater than the grief, 
I want to say it again. He can give joy that is greater than the grief and the sorrow and the sadness. That's what he will do when we trust in him. So he is here in this context of Revelation 21. God's saying it is done. His, his progressive purpose, his intended goal for mankind has been completed. And let me, let me add to it this thought that Revelation 21 and 22 is better than Genesis 1 and 2. And I love, I just love that thought and that truth. Gen uh, Revelation chapters 21 and 22, that's the last two chapters in the Bible, they are better than Genesis chapter 1 and 2. So the point is this, when God restores, and through, again, through what Christ accomplished through his death and resurrection, what's going to end up happening to this earth and mankind is going to be better than it was before the fall. Mm, powerful. All right, moving on here. He said in verse 7, He that overcomes shall inherit all things. I will be his God and he shall be my son. Now, when he mentions here, he who overcomes, we overcome by faith in Christ and faith in the Lamb, as Revelation uh, 12 and verse 11 says. And they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. So we overcome through our dependence upon Jesus and all that he has done. Amen? All right. Another thing here I want to bring up as it concerns this, in verse 7, it says that he shall inherit all things. So he who overcomes shall inherit all things. You know, inherit inheritance is only given to a child. And if, as he mentions in verse 7, I will be his God and he shall be my son. The idea of son, it means children. All right, so ladies, you're, you're God's daughter, okay? So it's son in a general sense. But inherit all things. Because we're children of God by simple faith, we shall inherit everything that Jesus died for. Man, it's just just the thought, man, I, I, it blows my mind. We have so much in our inheritance in Jesus. And by simple faith in him, and that's not some just mental ascent or just some words that come out of our mouth. True faith is from the heart in which we give our life to Christ because he gave his life for us. And we realize that we are nothing, we have nothing, but, but destruction ahead of us without Jesus Christ, That's who is God's gift to us. And so we inherit everything that Jesus died for. And Romans 8, verse 17, he said, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, and if so, it, that, if so be that we suffer with him, we shall also be glorified together. And so the idea, if we suffer with him, some take that as just our identification with Christ on the cross. Some take that as if, if we endure the trials, if we endure life, the life of faith, and it, it, with all of its ups and downs, all right, and, and trials and whatever, and, and get this, the grace of God is always greater than what we go through. But that's, I believe that's what that is referring to. Then he mentions in verse 8, and you can see this note on the bottom of the screen there, that it says this, But the fearful, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, warmongers, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That's just simply a statement in this context here, okay? That, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be all these people alive during the eternal state. And it doesn't mean that. It just means that unbelievers will have no part in the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. That's what that is referring to. All right, moving on here in verse 9. Uh, through 11, and it says, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show you the, lamb, the, the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Now, this, that's the new Jerusalem. Having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. 
Now, in verse 9 and these verses, it gives us one of the most, I think, fascinating statements about the New Jerusalem and th that there is in the Bible. Notice here in verse 9 that when he said here, come hither and I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And then right after that, he see, he, he's carried away in the spirit and he sees the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. All right. Now, with that said, there are some, and I, I hate to keep on saying that, but it, uh, it's the reality. There are some, and again, when I say some, I'm talking about respectable, legit Bible scholars and Bible prophecy teachers that have some different thoughts on this. Some are very dogmatic about it and say that the New Jerusalem only is the bride of Christ, based on what is said in these verses, verses 9 and 10, especially verse 9. Uh, but ver the, together, that the New Jerusalem is exclusively the Lamb's bride, uh, the, the bride of Christ, because that's what it says. I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife, and then he showed them the New Jerusalem. But there are others who take the approach that, no, it's only the redeemed that are the bride of Christ. And that is actually referred to in Revelation 19, verses 7 and 9. So it's one of those situations that we have in Revelation 19, 7 through 9. It's us. It's the redeemed. It's the saints, the redeemed of all the ages, which are called the Lamb's wife, the bride. Okay? we And it, I believe that is completely correct. I'm going to go with the scripture. The Bible says in Revelation 19, we are the bride of Christ. And also... In Revelation, I'm sorry, in Romans chapter 7, the first part of that chapter, it shows us that we, uh, through the, the, uh, the, the flesh of Christ, through his, what he accomplished at the cross, we are married to him, all right? So we're married to Christ. It says that, I believe in Revelation, uh, keep on saying Revelation, in Romans chapter seven, and I believe it's verse four, we're married to him. So the question is, what is it? Who Who is who is the Lamb's uh, bride? Who is the bride of Christ? Is it the saints or is it the New Jerusalem? I propose this thought, that both are the bride of Christ. And it, what and it, some you know, get can get all caught up uh, and get uh, angry about that statement. I had uh, someone uh, email me uh, some time ago, and this individual was very, very angry. And apparently, they had come across this statement. I don't know. I don't know if they were. I don't know where they came across, but they come across me mentioning this uh, at some point in the past. And they, this person was very upset, as if I was preaching a false gospel, another Jesus, another spirit. Because I had made the statement that both the redeemed and the New Jerusalem are the bride of Christ. Again, just based on what the these scriptures say. And uh, what it does that shows the close connection between the people of God and the place that we will live forever. And because we as the redeemed are going to be living in the New Jerusalem. Something, something we have to take into or factor in here as well is that the Jerusalem as a city is God's city. You go back to the Old Testament, God said, and I, forgive me for not having the references, but God said that it was the place that he put his name. It's like God stamped his name on the city of Jerusalem. And I know some can say, well, well, well God judged Jerusalem and destroyed it uh, through Babylon and then the Romans and 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 because of Israel's belief, God totally divorced Himself from all those statements in the Old Testament. Like, for example, Jerusalem is His city. But you know what? When we see other scriptures uh, in the Old Testament and now in the New, yes, it's true that Israel was rebellious, and yes, it is true Israel as a nation rejected Jesus as her Messiah and as the Lamb. But 
Romans chapter 9 through 11 tell us, and chapter 11 in particular, really emphasize the point that God has not rejected Israel as a nation. God still has a plan for Israel. And God still has a plan, I believe, for the city of Jerusalem. Notice it's the new Jerusalem, and it's not like some other city. All right, It's not the new Bethlehem. It's not the new Nazareth. It's not the new Babylon. Okay, it's not. It's not any of that. It is the new Jerusalem, because God has, if we could say it this way, a special relationship with that city. You mean God can have a relationship with a city? Well, the way that God talks about Jerusalem in the Old Testament, He personifies Jerusalem, and so. It's God's city. Again, it's the city that he chose for himself. Let me just conclude it with this this thought, that maybe the new Jerusalem is not the bride of Christ. And maybe in this passage, when he said, come hither, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And then right after that, he sees the new Jerusalem. Maybe it was just simply, he was talking about those who dwell in the new Jerusalem, all right? Maybe that's all it was referring to. And if that is the case, then that just, again, that going back to Revelation 19, 7 through 9, we are the bride of Christ, all right? So uh, I don't want to spend any more time on that. I think you get the gist of that. We are the bride of Christ, and we will live in the new Jerusalem forever and forever. It mentions about the new Jerusalem uh, in verse 11, that it has the glory of God. And that, that terminology, the glory of God, it refers to the radiant presence of God. And it says it's, it will be like jasper stone, clear as crystal. You know, jasper stone, which is mentioned several times in Revelation, uh, is, it is it was the last stone on the high priest ephod. And some believe it was the first stone, okay? But it was a stone on the high priest's uh, ephod. And jasper normally has some color to it, okay? Just like gold does. It has some color to it. J jasper is a, a jewel, gold again, a metal. But here we see that this, it's going to be jasper, like a, like a jasper stone, but it's clear as crystal. All right, so it will be something like we've never seen before. And the idea is this, that the glory of God will be will be like clear light that permeates the city. We're going to see more about that in just a moment. Let's, let's move on in the next passage. In verse 12, it says, And had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. And on the east, three gates, on the north, three gates, on the south, three gates, and on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, the gates thereof, and the wall thereof. And let's take a look at some points here as it concerns what I'll refer to here is a general description of the New Jerusalem. And I'll go through some of these things somewhat quickly. Number one, John said, or it was told, and he could see it as well, but he's told the dimensions here. He said he had a, a wall that was great and high, all right? And um, he said it was 144 cubits, all right? And that will be said later on, actually, in, in this passage uh uh, the verses after this, 144 cubits high. That's that's about a 216 feet high because a cubit was about 18 inches. So 216 feet high. Uh, I was just reading from a noted scholar that he viewed that as 216 feet thick. All right. I, I, I think this is referring to height. Now, with that said, 216 feet high. That may seem like, whoa, that's a huge wall. Let me just say this, that in, in, in comparison to the rest of the city, this wall is actually kind of like, it's more, it's more cosmetic than it is some you know, protective wall. Again, there's not going to be a need 
for protection from enemies. All right, so from for the New Jerusalem, there there will be no enemies to come against it. This wall is more cosmetic than it is anything else. Because when we will take a look at the New Jerusalem, the New Jerusalem is almost 1,500 miles high. Get that, 1,500 miles high, and it's got a wall that's 216 feet high. Do you get that? And so this is more cosmetic, but it says, number two, the wall has 12 gates, three on each side, and the names of the 12 tribes of Israel on each gate. So that's important as well. Number three, the city has 12 foundations made of precious stones in the name of the 12 apostles on each foundation. Those number two and number three are very important because what it shows us is that you've got the names of the 12 tribes of Israel and the names of the 12 apostles all in this city. And it shows us the unity between the old covenant and the new covenant. That's very important to understand. So in this new Jerusalem, we've got reminders of the old and the new. And old is not bad. Let me just say that. I don't mean old in a, in a negative. Old Testament, old covenant does not mean bad covenant. It's just, it's God's covenant. But he provided the new covenant, which is better and fulfilled the old covenant. So, but that doesn't mean the old is bad. So we've got this combination and unity of old and new. I want to interject this thought as it concerns the gates of the on the walls uh, of the city. And it tells us in verse 21 that each gate is going to be made of one pearl. Imagine that. Each gate. So you've got... You've got three gates on each side, 12 total gates, and each gate is made of one pearl each. Imagine the size of that oyster, okay? This is how glorious this new Jerusalem is going to be. Again, each gate ha being made of one pearl. Uh, it, 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 I think that blows our mind. Uh, another thought I want to interject here as it concerns the foundations. It mentions it as, you know, 12 foundations as I've already, I've already dealt with. But, you know, some view this as referring to 12 levels or 12 floors. And I can totally see that when we think about, you know, the city uh, being 1,500 miles high and square, basically it will be a cube, as we'll deal with more in just a minute. But uh, that that is that's massive. That is at least half of the size of the Middle East. The New Jerusalem will be a big, large cube, and I believe it will be a large cube. Uh, again, 1,500 miles square, 1,500 miles high, and that will be, I believe, there's going to be floors or levels, 12 levels, and that's the 12 foundations are 12 levels, uh, so meaning that if you're living on the 12th floor, okay, or 12th level of the New Jerusalem, you're living in outer space. That's how high, 1,500 miles high, uh, the New Jerusalem will be again, and it will be located most likely in the area of the Middle East. And as it says, it will come down out of heaven. And the question is, you know, sometimes, well, is it going to rest on the earth? Is it going to hover over the earth? Um, I don't have an answer for that. It very well hover over at least a portion of the earth. It's called the New Jerusalem. So both there'll be an actual Jerusalem on earth, and then there'll be a New Jerusalem. Or during the uh, the eternal state, the New Jerusalem will just rest on that area uh, where the old Jerusalem used to be. But it was it's going to be uh, 1,500 miles high. And it, it, it just goes beyond our comprehension. But we're going to live there as the redeemed. It's, it's going to be absolutely wonderful. All right, moving on here. In the next uh, several verses, verse 16 through 18, we continue looking at some of the general description of this city. In verse 16, And the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth, and he measured the city with the reed 12,000 furlongs, the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof 144 
uh, cubits, as I just mentioned, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. And the building of the wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. As I mentioned earlier, let me say this about verse 18. The building of the wall was of jasper. That means the wall was a was a jewel. It was a jewel. Get this. It's amazing. Made of one jewel of jasper. All right? And but clear, it's clear if you remember right. And then he said the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. So the gold has a transparency to it, so that the glory of God shines through the whole city. So moving on here in verse uh, or number four, the city is four square, it's twelve thousand furlongs. Now that's approximately fifteen hundred miles long, wide, and high. Now, some believe that the city is the shape of a pyramid. Some believe it is the shape of a cube. So, let me say that again. There are some who believe that the New Jerusalem is going to be in the shape of a pyramid based on, again, as it says in verse 16, the length and the breadth and the height are equal. uh, And it's four square. Now, personally, I don't understand the whole idea that some say it's going to look like a pyramid, I, I don't understand that. I, I think it's going to be more of a cube, but uh, again, some believe that. And also, number five, the city was made of pure gold like on the clear glass. But this pure gold is going to be, it's not going to be gold like we've ever seen before. Gold, again, is not transparent. But this gold, uh, let me just say it this way, it's glorified gold. All right, (laughs) it is glorified gold. The glory of God shines right through it. I want to move on here and touch on some other thing. Another point here. I'm gonna I'm gonna go off the screen uh, here. Um, Number number six. If you can see it there, number six. The street and the city square is of pure gold. So that's important as well as, as you can see there in verse. Uh, in verse 19, I'll read it. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the the third uh, chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth uh, sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth uh, chrysoprasis, if I said that right, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth and amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls, and every several gate was of one pearl, and the city of the street was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. So let me just say this again. Again, this gold is going to be glorified gold, and and it mentions it again at the end of verse 21, uh, and the street, the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. I want to I want to move on and get to this next couple verses here, 22 and 23 before we end today. And, he, and John said, "And I saw no temple therein." That means a building. He saw no building like a temple in the New Jerusalem, the New Heaven, and the New Earth. Okay, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. That means just their presence is the dwelling place of God. There's no need for a building. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Now, with this said, if you look at number 7 and 8 on the bottom of the list here, we've already gone through the first six, but number 7 and 8, there is no temple in it, for God and the Lamb are its temple. And the glory of God and the Lamb is the light of the city. No sun or moon are needed. Now, as I alluded to earlier, some believe that this is a reference to the millennium. Now, uh, if it's not the millennium, this is definitely going to be what it is throughout eternity. All right, that's that's huge. Throughout eternity. I want to keep on going here in this passage. And it says... In verses 24 through 27. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, 
and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut all at all by day, for there shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defiles, neither whatsoever works abomination or makes a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now this is one of those passages as we end this video class that, that can bring some confusion because, again, we're talking about the eternal state. And it mentions in this passage that nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. That means the, the light of the new Jerusalem, the light of God, and of the glory of God and the, of the Lamb that permeates the new Jerusalem. And I believe you could say the whole earth. And so, but it mentions here the nations of them that are saved. Now, as I, you can see that, that bullet there, the two main views that concern Revelation 21 and 22 is, number one, they describe the millennium and the eternal state, or number two, they describe only, it's a typo, only the eternal state. Do you, do you follow that? So, millennium and the eternal state, or only the eternal state. Now, it mentions here, again, the nations of them which are saved. Now, what does that mean? If that refers to the eternal state, what does that mean? If that refers to the millennium, then definitely we can understand that because there will be people that are not saved during, during the millennium. So let me just read it to you. Two main views concerning the nations of them which are saved. Number one, it refers to saved Gentile nations during the millennium. Number two, it refers to saved Gentile nations during the eternal state. Now, <laughs> now, we can understand number one, but number two, I know that is, that's probably bringing up some questions. What refers to saved Gentile nations during the millennia, during the eternal state? You mean that's a possibility? Well, in next video class, we're going to talk about that some more. All right? So you don't want to miss next video class. And so I pray this has been a blessing to you today. We have so much to look forward to in Christ. But God bless you and have a wonderful day in Jesus.